All right, we're back for part two of the lecture. Hopefully you guys have all seen Dr. Byrus' lecture um, or a quick little interview I did with him. I think it's really helpful to get his viewpoint. Um, you mean he sees 350 research articles a year. So understanding kind of what he looks for when he's uh, reading these articles, what's gonna determine if it passes that first hurdle, is it gonna go out for review, is really important. One of the things we talked about is the importance of a cover letter. And I also have a video about uh, that in this week's module as well. I wanted to kind of broach the topic along with this of, okay, cover letters are not only important for uh, submitting a journal article. They're also important for getting a job. And I know some of us who are finishing up with our master's degree are probably going to be looking for a job. So what I've done here in the document that I'm going to be uploading is I have just a cut and paste of my cover letter I wrote for this very job. What did I do when I wanted to get this job? Well, I looked at the job description. Same thing, I put it in a nice kind of business format overall. I didn't have uh, uh, any sort of letterhead when I was there, but I did kind of break it down into that same four paragraph format that we looked at our cover letter for our journal article and said, okay, I'm gonna introduce myself and then I'm gonna tell me what uh, within the job description how do my experiences meet that? Okay, and then this is a separate section where I talked about uh, instruction because this is all about research up here in paragraph two because that was the main area I had experience in before I came to Wyoming. Here's a little bit about teaching and then following up, it's, this is that putting a bow on it here on the bottom um, at the end. And generally cover letters are gonna be only about one page um, in length because it's going to a committee who's gonna have to look at a lot of applicants. You don't want a three page document in there that they're gonna have to slog through and get a bad feeling about. You want something quick, concise, and to the point that looks very professional. The biggest thing is you have to understand, especially with jobs at the um, you know kind of state academic level, the necessary amount of paperwork needed to put a job forward to get uh, hired for a full-time tenure track job is insane. You have to make this giant uh, job description with all these different line items in it and has to go through all these different levels of approval. And then the review committee looks at all of the applications based on that very job description. Okay, so when you're writing your cover letter, what are you gonna do? Well, you're gonna submit your CV, which by the time you're uh, applying for jobs like this is gonna be super long. What you want to do in your cover letter is highlight the things in your CV that apply to each and every one of those line items on that job description. Direct those people where to go. And then maybe if you were served on a committee and your CV says, I served on this committee, this is your opportunity to expand on that and say, why that committee applies to one of their different uh, requests for that job description. So what I have in here is a little cover letter practice exercise. And this is something that you can do on your own if you'd like. This is an optional assignment. You will not get graded on this. Um, you won't get any bonus points for it either if you wanna do it. Um, but if you want to get some feedback on writing a cover letter, here's your opportunity. I will be happy to grade any of these that get submitted to me. Just email it to me if you want. All I'm asking you to do is look through two things. You can choose one or the other. Below I have, here is an internship um, advertisement for Usarium, which is an environmental medicine within the military uh, research lab. It's an internship for undergraduate students uh, or graduate or upper level undergraduate students. And these are the things they tell you you're gonna do. And this is a little bit more about the job down here. And these are the points that you have to take about, okay? So what's your address? Who's the receiver? What's the receiver's address? Who will be receiving the submission? And what's their position title? And it's a little bit confusing because you look at this, well, it came from Dave Looney, but it says up here, interested individuals should email their CV to this person right here, Chief Adam Potter, okay? So it's important to make sure you read the entire thing. And then I'm just asking, okay, what specific traits about the organization make them worthy of your employment? Uh, what specific traits make you the most qualified person to work there? And then the other thing I have is after these lines, I have, okay, or publish your research. Because the second example I have after this job is a call for papers. 
you might see this for your research as well, where a journal, here's one right here, a uh, guest editor, Tim Munch, along with the editorial team of AGP Heart and Circ, okay, invite submission of original research articles related to mechanisms by which acute exercise and exercise training mediates changes in cardiovascular function in disease. Okay, so this is going to be posted out there and you're going to write a paper, but before you do that, you're going to write a cover letter about how your paper fits the needs of this. And you can see there's a bunch of different information about in here about how it should be formatted, who it should go to right down here, and things like that. So if you want to kind of practice what to do in a cover letter, this is a great opportunity to do it. Okay, what traits about you make uh, you the most qualified person to publish your research? Why is your paper so good? Okay, and then you want to make yourself stand out, put a little bit of passion, and then you want to tie a nice little bow on it and summarize at the end. So the reason I'm putting this in here is just to talk about cover letters a little bit more and say, okay, having a cover letter for your research paper is good, but there are some other opportunities where you're going to need a cover letter as well. And I wanted to just go over those quickly because if you're a person graduating this semester, you're probably going to have to write one of these pretty soon. And having a good cover letter, it's your opportunity to make a first impression. It has to be good. Okay, now let's move on. We're going to finish this lesson with a little bit about peer review. Okay. During my postdoc was the first time I really started to peer review. Actually, during uh, the end stages of my PhD. End stage of my PhD, my mentor would get probably 10 to 15 review requests per week. And every once in a while, he, he'd email me and say, you know, Evan, I'm, I'm not going to be able to do this one on my own. Would you be able to help me out with it? Okay. And it's not that he would just give it entirely to me, but he would have me go through, provide some comments, and then the two of us would kind of go through it together. All right. So, how do you want to do this? Well, here's just an example of a very, very short review. I obviously kind of truncated this because you didn't need to see all the points. So um, this was about cardiorespiratory fitness and independently associated with beta cell function in individuals with metabolic syndrome, fitness versus fatness. So it's about fitness or body fat percentage. What you want to do overall is the main structure of your review is going to be sectioned into two parts. Your general comments overall and then your specific comments. General comments, you kind of want to review what the paper was about overall and say, are there any big, giant, overall main concerns? Okay, And I say in here, one other main point is to be careful of the statements of importance of fitness versus fatness in terms of mitigation of risk factors related to the metabolic syndrome. The current investigation did not test this question. Okay, so obviously they were talking about fitness and fatness, but they didn't actually test how frequently people died with these different uh, things. So this was something very important for me to get out there, and it wasn't specific to a line. And then the second point is about your specific comments. The biggest help you can be, especially if the paper is pretty good, you want to make sure that that person can find the statement you have a comment about really quickly, and you put the page number and the line number that it's on. Okay. For example, here, there are a lot of abbreviations in the manuscript that make reading difficult. If pancreatic beta cells are the only beta cells referred to, in other words, no comparison to beta cells elsewhere in the body, then PBC can be removed and beta cells can be used to clarify. Okay, just a suggestion. One thing you will notice that I did not put in any of these is you used a lot of abbreviations. The important thing when you are writing a manuscript review, a peer review, this is about the paper. This is about the paper and this is about the data. This is not about the person writing it. Even though I guarantee you're going to read a paper and in the back of your head think this person is a moron. You're going to think that because there are a lot of really bad papers out there. You cannot write that in your review, no matter how bad it is. Was there a fatal flaw in their, in their methodology? Put that in there. I, I am sorry to report that there appears to be a fatal flaw in these investigators' methodology. Okay, That is about the methods. That is not about that person being bad Okay, or uh, not being able to do the research. You want to avoid the use of you or I while you're writing this. This is objective. This is about only what you read. Okay, so that's a really important thing. Two different sections, general comments, specific comments, and then making sure it's about the paper and about the data, not about the person. Okay, 
let's talk about, let's end with the more important side of it. What happens if you get peer reviews back? How to respond to reviewer comments. Okay, I got this color coded here because after this, I have included actually my response to reviewer comment document right here. This is an actual response to reviewer comments that I put in. And this response to reviewer comment document was eight pages long. And I've included all eight pages here for you to review and peruse on your own time. I mean, tomorrow's Friday night. You might want to do it then with some friends, get together, and, you know, read some response to reviewer comments. But let's go over some of the main takeaways of how to respond appropriately to reviewer comments. Number one, this is the easiest thing you can do to make a difference for your, review, your reviewer. Remember, this is the person standing between you and your paper getting published make their job easy. So the first way to do that is to format it so it's easy to read. Separate each reviewer. Here's reviewer one and then after I finish responding to reviewer two, reviewer one I'm going to make sure to put on a separate page reviewer two. Next separate each comment into actionable items. Sometimes you will get a block of text as a single comment from a reviewer. And within that block of text, they will have four or five different points that you can address. Separate that out, okay? The person will see that you've done that. Then you also want to number them, okay? Each item in case you need to reference a comment. Let's look at an example from my review. Okay, I've color coded these so I can find them pretty easily. In this comment right here above in blue, which we'll go back to in a minute, they asked about my control for menstrual cycle because it was a study about uh, fluid intake and fluid regulation. And we know that fluid regulation in women is going to be influenced by menstrual cycle hormones. Okay, so two of the reviewers had this comment. So what we can say here is I was able to say, we thank both reviewers for bringing up this point. See reviewer three, comment number one. Now, this reviewer, when they get this document back, can go look at that comment because all reviewers get all reviews. I get to see the other reviewers' comments as well afterwards, and I can say, oh, they had this comment as well. Let's see how the author responded to that comment if it was slightly different, okay? So we have the ability to uh, label the different uh, comments. Here's comment number one. Back to my tips and tricks and make your responses e easy to differentiate, okay? So let's look at our first one right here. Here's their first comment, whoops. And then you can see in bold, after each of the number comments, I have author response. Here's comment number two, author response. That lets them know exactly where that's gonna be. So these little formatting tricks can actually make a big difference for your reviewer. Number two, okay, we'll move on. Respond to every comment, every single one, even if it is like, hey, great job on that section. Okay, you want to make sure that they know you were very detail oriented. Let's look at an example of this. Here in yellow, this person had a really simple comment. Line 98, I would suggest moving the mLs per deciliter to the minus one, so the units, in front of the bracket, brackets as opposed to after the brackets. All I said in response, thank you for the recommendation, completed. Let them know that I've done that. Number three, if you make a correction or edit, you want to do two things. Remember, we are trying to make this easy for the reviewer. If they have asked for a minimal amount of reviews, chances are if you make your response to reviewer comments document good enough, they will only read that. And if they only read that and they get the warm fuzzies about them, they will say, oh, author responded adequately to all of my suggestions. I accept this paper now. What you don't want them to do is to be a little bit cloudy that if you did or did not make those corrections, and then they go back to the paper and then they find more things that they don't like. You don't want that. You want just to address the comments that they had and then to say, man, this person did a bang up job. Let's move this through to publication. So the two things you can do here when you're responding to reviewer comments, number one, include the addition in the response document. <laughs> and then number two, provide the line number so that the reviewer can check this submission. 
So it's looking great. Here we go. Could you please support these claims, sensitivity and specificity with actual numbers? This would prove a point and add the, to the overall story development. And if you look on the next page, I say, okay, the new sentence reads, and here's the actual quote that I put into the thing. And I said, you can find this on line number 74. So if the person is not comfortable with just reading this line of text right here, they can say, oh, well, if I got the document right next to it, I'll just look at line 74 and find it. Oh, in the context that I'm reading here, it looks great. This is good. <clears throat> One thing to remember, when you're putting these line numbers in, this you do last. Because as you go through, if you look at the number of comments overall, I think there were like 75 different comments from the two reviewers. As you make the changes and add and subtract from your, your document, your line numbers are going to change. So what I usually do is when I'm making this document, I will put a line number XX, and then I will like highlight that XX, usually in yellow. And then I'll say, okay, I know that when I'm done with this paper, I have to check what line number that's on just to make sure I have the right one. Okay. Um, so that's if you make corrections or edits, do those two things. And you can see in some sections, let's find another one. Here's one where I added a whole paragraph. And I included that whole paragraph in italics right here for that person to easily find and easily be able to read how I addressed their comment above. They can just read this document, look at the paragraph. Does that paragraph address my comment? Psh, great. I'm happy with that now. Last section is probably the most important. When you get reviewer comments back, do not think of this as a big hit to your ego. This person, if they are being an appropriate reviewer, and this doesn't always happen, is not coming after you. Just like I, when I said when you are reviewing, you're reviewing the paper and the data, so is that reviewer when they're reviewing yours. Responding to their, com their comments correctly is going to make your paper better. Now, that does not mean you have to do it every time. It's okay to disagree. But if you disagree, be polite. Give rationale. Don't just say, no, I'm not going to do that thing that you're asking me to do, or no, I'm not going to explain it, or you're an idiot. I don't understand why you would think that. And then the last thing I found that is nice about this is to find some common ground. So let's look at an example from one of my responses. And we gave the example before. This person wants to know, okay, they were women who were tested, you know, likely early follicular phase, for example, you know, um, were they in a specific cycle phase? Because we know that fluence balance is influenced by that. My study did not rely on that. And actually the data out there about fluid changes during different phases of the menstrual cycle is not that hard and fast. So what I did was first, I thanked the reviewers to bring it, bring it up. And then I said, okay, the research is quite clear. And I went into the paper that they referenced because they gave me a link to a paper right here. Okay. And I said, Hey, you're looking at this paper or that paper relies on this paper. Well, it turns out that paper says that they force fed these women. Actually, they gave them injections of different hormones. And that's way different than women who were not on contraceptives like was in our study overall. And then I gave a couple other papers. Here we go. Here are the four papers that I reference in this. But what I did was I found common ground at the end. However, this is an important point. It's obviously imp important because two reviewers brought it up. To make all readers in the following section and relevant references have now been added to the method section. So what I did was I said, I am not going to say that this paper is bad because we didn't control for menstrual cycle. I'm going to give you some evidence of why we didn't. And then I'm going to actually add to my paper to make sure that anybody else reading it doesn't have the same question. And guess what? This came back after I put these in and there was no problem. All right. So if you disagree, remember, be polite, give rationale, and find some common ground. The last thing. And this is a mistake I see over and over again, because when you get these comments back from the reviewer, you're going to think, ah, this person's an idiot. And you're in the mindset of, you have done this mountain of work, especially if it's your master's thesis. You did a lit review. You proposed your lit review. 
you did the entire study, all the data collection, weeks and months and you know long nights of doing that data collection, and then you did the analysis. You did this analysis that took so long. You had to work with your mentor and call in a statistical you know uh, supervisor, and they figured it out. And okay, we got the numbers, and then you wrote the paper. And then you send it to your co-authors, and your co-author said, "Ah, it's terrible. Try again. Write it again. Okay, this section looks okay now. All right, we're finally ready to submit it." And you submit it, and you think, "Ah, this is it." And then you get more comments back, and you're like, "This is the last thing. I've written ten versions of this paper now, and I did all this work." But guess what? You want to do it. If the reviewer asks for a change that doesn't change the outcome of your study, do it. Don't say. It doesn't matter. I don't need to do that. You know, uh, I respectfully decline to do make that edit. Just do it. If it doesn't change, it doesn't matter. Okay. Here's an example. What if they want me to rerun statistics that will take a long time and won't change my results? Guess what? In this paper, somebody asked me to do it. Let's look in red. Here we go. This person wanted to know about the assumption of normality and if my data were different from a normal distribution. And guess what? I hadn't talked about that at all. And I went back and I had to rerun all my stats for normality. I think it changed one value within urine-specific gravity because I went from a, a, you know, a regular test to a Wilcoxon rank sum test, so I, I couldn't necessarily do my ANOVA. And it changed that one outcome. All other tests were identical, uh, and when comparing traditional t-tests with Bonferroni correction versus Wilcoxon rank sum, okay, no difference. This took me over one day to do. I had to rerun everything. I had to update all of my tables to identify which ones were uh, normal and which ones weren't. More than one day to respond to this single comment. But guess what? After I sent these response reviewer comments in. It got accepted. It was worth it. It took a whole day to do that. Even though it didn't change the outcome of the paper, it was worth it. So, other things that I've had. Um, what if they want me to rerun statistics? What if they want me to completely reformat a figure? I've had that happen before. Not in this paper, but I've asked people to have me completely reformat a figure. Make a new figure. Get rid of that one. Do this other one. It's going to take me two to three hours to do that. Ugh, do it. Suck it up. Do the revision. If it doesn't change the outcome of your paper, give that reviewer the warm fuzzies that they are making your paper 10 times better because you're using a different font in your figure. Just get it done. Okay. Remember, they are what's standing between you and publication. Unless you, if you if you have a rationale to disagree, by all means, disagree. If what they're asking you to change is going to change the outcome of your paper in a way that you do not think works with the interpretation of the data, that's rationale for not doing it. But if it doesn't, suck it up, do the work, make it better. It's going to make the paper better overall. Okay, That's your pep talk right here for responding to reviewer comments. Um, I really encourage you to take this seriously. This can be a point where you can make or break your paper right here. Just like with the cover letter, it's the very small things that are going to make the difference between you getting your paper in and maybe having to wait and resubmit to another journal. So take your time with this, make it a good document, and get your paper accepted after that first round. Uh, the last thing I'll say for this week's lecture, uh, it's been great working with everybody. I, I really appreciate all the emails and, and, and requests for clarifications that people have had on the assignments. You have one assignment left. And that uh, rubric is going to be posted on Monday of next week. And that will just be a change to your bad slides. Okay, um, Your bad slides, I just want a kind of an introduction. In this change, I want to see you change 10 things overall. And I want you to tell a good story along with it. I'm really looking forward to watching these and providing some feedback. Uh, with that, I also know it's the end of the semester and the end of a really weird semester. And things are going to start to pile up. You might have a proposal or a thesis defense coming up. You might have papers due in other uh, classes. This class is not supposed to be a stressor. My grades are due on the 28th of May. If I receive your assignment by the 27th of May, I'm grading it. I'm putting it in your, um, your final grade. Okay. I don't want a mountain of grades, so try and get these in as soon as you can. Um, but with that said, 
If you need an extra week to do one of the Excel assignments, I get it. I've been at the end of the semester before as well. I have not been at the end of the semester with a pandemic happening. So I want to make sure that I'm sensitive to that and understand that people have a lot of different responsibilities right now. So what I would do is if you're going to be late on the assignment, just send me an email and let me know, hey, Dr. J, I'm going to be late on this one. A lot of people have done that, and I really appreciate it. So just keep doing that. Send me that email to let me know you're going to be a couple days late and get that assignment in. I want you to get the knowledge from practicing some of these different skills because it's going to pay off down the road. All right? With that, I'll leave it there. And thank you guys for a great semester, and I'll see you around the way.